Hi, this is Rachel, and today we are going to be talking about topic 24 in our supervision curriculum, and this is social skills. So today we've talked about social skills before, but today we are going to talk about social skills from the perspective of the consultant or supervisor who might be the one creating the program. So previously, when we discussed social skills, we really talked about it from the perspective of the implementer, who's going to be supporting the learner while they work on their social skills. So just a reminder, the things that we want to focus on with social skills are not around trying to make somebody fit into an environment, but instead trying to get uh, that person's needs met in a way that is efficient and effective in that social environment. So we are still meeting the needs of the learner, but we are helping them to get their needs met in a way that is likely to be reinforced in the environment. Um, and another thing, just kind of a side note, but just to put it out there, um, the way the world works now with the internet and the ability to connect with people who have similar interests, even at a great distance, our goal should never be trying to make somebody fit in with the peers that are in closest proximity to them. Instead, our goals should be around helping our learners to find and connect with the individuals that share their interests. So um, when we talk about social skills, we really want to talk about meeting the needs of the individual just in a way that is going to be most effective in that environment, which sometimes requires, oftentimes requires the environment learning how to adjust as well. Um, a primary goal of social intervention is to identify approaches that enhance their uh, skills in naturalistic settings with peers. Now, just putting someone near their peers or with their peers does not mean that learning is going to occur, does not mean that those peers and that individual are going to uh, communicate well or interact well. So we do want to set up opportunities where we are teaching the skills necessary for the peers and our learners to interact with each other. And again, it's not that we are making our learner have to fit within the peer expectation. There is learning going both ways, teaching the peers also how to accept and interact with a learner who may respond differently. So when we are selecting peers, we do want to find peers that are going to be good models, that are going to be good participants, that are going to be good learners themselves, when we are interacting. So again, the focus is not on taking our learner and making them fit what the peers already do, but instead also teaching the peers how to interact with the learner as well as teaching the learner how to interact with the peers so that they can all interact together. Now, peers are going to be the, the natural social partners um, if your learner that you're supporting is in a school setting, those peers might be same aged peers, but if they are in a different setting or as our learners grow up, once you kind of get out of school, your peers are going to be the individuals that you interact with on a regular basis, not necessarily your same age. If you are working at a job, you will have coworkers who are your peers of different ages. If you are, even for younger learners, if you are homeschooling, perhaps your peers are the neighborhood uh, children that are nearby, which could be different ages. Or if you're attending um, uh, smaller classes or after school activities, your peers are those individuals that are participating, which might be close to age, but may not be exactly the same age. So we don't want to focus on just somebody that is the same age. And like I said before, we want to find peers that 
could be friends, right? If we're trying to teach friendship skills and skills about getting along with each other, we want to find people that will make good peers or good potential friends for our learners. So finding individuals with similar interests, um, finding peers that are um, interested in interacting with our learner and that are going to uh, behave in a manner that we want our learner to be exposed to. We don't want to pick peers that are rude or mean or are not capable of displaying the skills that we are wanting our learner to be around. Um, so we do want to select peers that have um, age-appropriate play skills, but really we're looking at shared interests and that again are displaying the interactive skills, the social skills that we are looking to work on with our learner. Um, we want to have good models. We want to have uh, people who also are able to display the same kind of interaction skills instead of um, having to work on those skills uh, with everyone at the same time. Although if you are talking about maybe a classroom setting, maybe everybody is working on those skills at the same time. In kindergarten, you're not going to find peers necessarily that can do all of the social skills that they're all working on because they're all still in kindergarten and learning. You also want to try to find peers that may be able to take a little bit more of a social active role, not necessarily bossy or pushy. Um, and it doesn't have to be at the exclusion, right? We don't want to put um, a very extroverted uh, a peer with a very introverted uh, learner because that might be aversive for both of them. However, maybe somebody that's a little bit more confident, a little bit um, more willing and able to put themselves out there to initiate a little bit more. If both your peer and your learner um, lack or do not display those initiation skills very often or very well, then it might be hard to actually get an interaction going, at least initially. So keep those in mind. Um, other criteria for selecting pill peers, you want them to be able to interact with you, to follow instructions so that you can provide some of that peer guidance to help educate them on how to help interact with this individual. They have to be willing to participate as well. Ascent is very important. Just like for our learners, we want ascent um, to participate in the activities. We also want to gain, gain ascent for our peers. Um, consent from parents or caregivers is also important. We need to make sure we have that. But even if the parents say, yeah, you can use my kid as a peer, if the peer doesn't want to come and play, then we're not going to force them. Just like if our learner doesn't want to come and play with peers, we're not going to force them. We're going to work on creating an environment where people want to be there and people want to interact. And then we have a teaching moment. Um, so there are benefits to interacting with peer groups, mutual benefits, not just for individuals um, who need support with their social skills, but also, like I said, for the peers to be able to interact with and better understand uh, individuals who may be different from them. Social communication and interactions should be continuously embedded into um, these groups and what we're working on. And working with peers allows an opportunity to generalize those skills from working one-on-one -on -one with maybe an adult or a provider and to be able to demonstrate those skills in a more natural setting with your more natural peers um, so that we can make sure that those skills have generalized. 
So there are a variety of different ways you can set this up. It could be structured groups that are designed to target specific skills, or you may find um, that there are some natural uh, informal groups that you are able to capitalize on for teaching opportunities. However, in both cases, you want to make sure that you are providing the support necessary for the learner to be successful and for the peers to be successful with interacting with the learner. So here is some implementation criteria that have been found to greatly increase the successful outcomes of a peer or social group. So um, everybody's committed to the group. Um, you do a minimum of 10 minutes each time and you meet frequently three to four times per week. There's at least one other peer there, but two to five is a nice small group size. Um, there is an adult supervising or a provider or trainer supervising and helping to facilitate those interactions, also providing reinforcement and feedback to all the individuals. Um, the activities are social, so there's a lot of peer interaction, um, not just we're sitting at the same uh, desk and we're listening to the teacher, but there's a lot of interaction opportunities. They are fun, both for the peers and for our individuals, and they're motivating for everybody to want to participate. Um, the training to set up for these peer groups involves uh, teaching the peers ahead of time so that the peers know how to interact and can help support the learner in those situations. Here's some examples of different types of schedules or ideas if you're trying to come up with how would we set this up. So maybe there's a play group at the Early Childhood Center that meets four days a week and it's from 20 to 30 minutes um, and there's a, a paraprofessional or a TA and the speech provider are monitoring those. Maybe there are play stations at home with the siblings and maybe neighborhood kids. And that's four days a week and they rotate through the different activities together. And maybe they can be, you know, fun hands-on projects that all the siblings can do together. Um, maybe there's a lunch group every day at the Early Childhood Center. Uh, maybe at the playground three days a week or the park three days a week, you have a play group that comes and meets up and it's maybe friends and neighbors and you guys do some organized um, sport type things or obstacle courses or something very like gross motor hands on engaging for your learners. Maybe after that play group, there is also a snack group that meets at the same time or meets right afterwards. So after they've done all that play, then everybody hangs out, have a big picnic um, and do uh, work on those same maybe conversational skills about what just happened while you are eating. So um, we want to make sure that we are teaching skills that are going to be helpful in meeting our learners' needs in the social environment. Some examples that we might want to target if our learner um, struggles with these would be gaining their peers' attention, um, maintaining that attention, uh, expanding upon conversations, staying on topic, or how to transition appropriately to a new topic of conversation, um, acknowledging each other's interests, um, signaling, uh, we talked about that, the topic shifts, understanding some non-vocal or non-verbal communication, and avoiding topics that might be uncomfortable for another individual. We want to try to specifically teach a wide range of functional social and communication skills. So we don't want to select just one skill and it works in one environment and it doesn't work with other people and it doesn't work with in other settings. We want to make sure that we're looking at a wide variety of skills so that our learner can pick and choose what skills make the most sense for them, make the most sense for the peers they're interacting with, make the most sense for the environment they are interacting in. 
Here are some more examples of skills that might be targeted in peer groups. Um, play entry and organization. So how do we get a game started? How do we join an activity that's already started? Um, how do we get the attention of someone? Um, how do we wait and listen and let other people take turns in directing the play? Sharing. Um, how do we share and take turns, whether that's with items or within a game? Requesting, um, being able to request from peers in a way that peers uh, know and understand what the individual is asking for. Um, helping your friends, helping other individuals to participate, complimenting or encouraging others, again, conversational skills, uh, maintaining play and conversation at the same time, expanding upon that, and also problem solving skills so that if um, the, the peer group runs into a challenge that our learner is able to help and support that problem solving strategy, or if they run into uh, challenges in interactions with their peers that they can use problem solving strategies to help still get their needs met to still participate in a way that is meaningful to them. Um, let's see. So we might also um, provide examples of specific initiations or statements or phrases, communication skills that can be very pivotal um, for both the peers to be able to communicate with the individual and for our individual to communicate with the peers. So these right here are examples of strategies that you might teach to your peers so that they are better able to communicate with an individual who may still be learning some of those social and communication skills. Maybe teaching pivotal phrases such as my turn and let's play that are nice, simple, short, easy to understand. Um, uh, friendly behaviors, maybe exaggerating some behaviors while our learners are still learning. So smiling bigger, um, making sure that you have the learner's attention um, by uh, focusing on them maybe using imitation hey watch me do it like this to help model uh for the individual to be able to participate in case the language is not uh, sufficient for them to understand the expectations um maybe using scripts or pictures having some of those things in the environment to help an individual who communicates in that way so that the peers can more easily communicate with the individual in the way that they communicate modeling and role playing with the peer beforehand so that they know what to expect and how to respond um, and then modeling and role playing with the individual so that they know what to expect and how to respond and then you can put everybody together. Um, also, maybe using video modeling to kind of set up the expectations. Um, and that could be used for the individual, but it also could be used for the peers so that they understand what the goal is and what the outcome is that we're looking for. And finally, self-monitoring skills, uh, both for our learner and for our peers, can help increase the frequency and the quality of those social behaviors if we have everybody kind of monitoring their own behavior and um, trying to meet goals of engaging with the other individual. When we program for generalization, we also want to make sure that we are selecting peers and materials that are going to generalize well to other situations. This was sort of what I mentioned before, just because somebody is close by, maybe they're the same age, they're in the same classroom, they may not be a good peer because that uh, the things that the individual and the peer have in common may not uh, 
be very much. It may not generalize, right? So we want to try to find peers that have a lot of interests and similar interests. And then when we're setting things up, we want to set up situations that are going to be similar to what our learner is encountering. If our learner's uh, social opportunities are in um, you know, uh, play settings, uh, then doing play groups with peers would make sense. If our learners' uh, social opportunities are more in like after school clubs or activities, then that's what we're going to want to try to set up or replicate um, or facilitate in some way instead of doing something that the skills are not going to generalize. We want to try to include multiple peers. Everybody's going to interact a little bit differently and it helps for generalization to practice skills with a lot of different individuals. We might want to practice certain skills across a variety of environments. If it's a skill that's going to be used in a variety of environments, then we want to practice it across those environments so that it can generalize. And we want to reinforce these behaviors and make sure that we are teaching behaviors that will be reinforced in these natural environments. Um, so some common uh, problems and possible solutions for an individual uh, for setting up these peer groups. What if the individual really doesn't like peers? Um, so you might start with just one peer or a very small group. You want to look for peers that have a lot of similar interests so they can share interests together. Um, you want to keep it at a very short amount of time to start with, have very powerful reinforcers and use very preferred items to make it fun. Oftentimes, individuals do not avoid their peers unless they have had negative interactions before. So we want to try and make this a really positive experience for everybody. What if the learner doesn't have a lot of play skills yet? How do we set up a play group if our learner doesn't have a lot of those skills yet? So use very small segments of the games, uh, teach toy play um, outside of the peer group to help dim, um, increase their fluency with some of those activities. Um, ask caregivers in the home to also facilitate that play. So we do have to build up skill sets in order to then work on generalizing them to occurrence with peers. This might also be a signal that the learner isn't interested in whatever that particular play is. So can we build a play group around more preferred play or activities for that individual? What if there are a low number of interactions? Maybe you can arrange the environment so that the activity requires a bit more interaction. So for example, I've done this with uh, puzzles at a table with preschoolers where each person had the pieces to the other person's puzzle. So they'd give them a few pieces at a time. And then when they had done all those, they just asked their friend, hey, can you hand me some more pieces? Um, and that created an opportunity where puzzles might be more of a solo activity to make it a little bit more interactive. Um, maybe look for uh, opportunities to comment on or encourage uh, interaction when watching the other person perform the task and build that into your turn taking. One person takes their turn and the other person comments or compliments them or encourages them on how they're doing and then they switch. Maybe there are scheduling problems. Scheduling issues are definitely challenging and something that we want to work through. But if you try to create a lot of different opportunities, then if some um, maybe lull for a little while, you can still have peer opportunities in those other settings. Um, who's going to be supporting the individuals in these uh, peer groups? And this might be where you need to recruit some additional service providers, add a different uh, uh, facilitator. So maybe um, if you're at a school and you can use some of those other related service providers, maybe the speech uh, person has 
a group and maybe the OT person has a group or they rotate. Um, maybe there are older peers that would be willing to come and volunteer and facilitate some of that. Or maybe you do uh, employ somebody to help facilitate some peer groups. Um, if you run into challenges with uh, identifying the goals and working with the team. It's best to just get everybody on the same page, talk about what's in the best interest of the individual, include that individual as much as they are able to participate and come to those solutions together as a team. So how do we get started? First, you want to identify who you are supporting with this peer group, who are the individuals that you are trying to create this opportunity for, what do you want them to learn, what activities would you like to use, how much time um, do you want to spend, uh, how many people are going to be involved, who's going to be responsible, what materials are you going to need, um, getting all the permissions, sharing that information, recruiting the peers to be involved, conducting some peer training so that the peers are better able and prepared to support in that environment, um, get everything scheduled, and then start implementing those programs. You also want to evaluate the effectiveness of that and make changes as needed. Um, next steps, you want to plan programs on an individual basis. So make sure that you are planning a group around the individuals that you're trying to support, not forcing an individual into a group that is not a good fit for them. Work out schedules, plan it ahead of time, uh, train for new social groups when you want to um, expand or introduce new settings or new peers, and maybe start training uh, parents, caregivers, and community uh, providers to support additional groups so that there are more groups as an option for your learner. So the assignment would be to identify three social skill goals for one client. Um, now, in this case, if you don't have three goals for one particular client, you could have three goals for different individuals. Um, but generally, you could probably find a couple of goals that are related um, that you can support for one learner. Write a peer program for teaching each goal. So write a program that would include peers. And in that, you want to include how you're going to teach and prepare the peers to be good peers for this then peer group or peer program to target these skills for your learner. And then describe the generalization process that's used when you're teaching peers. So start with um, how are you starting um, your peer group and then how are you going to generalize that so that it expands and the learner can use those skills in other environments. So thank you so much. And next time we will be talking about managing a team. So subscribe if you want to see more of these. Thank you so much.